All right, that's a little better. Okay, hi. So, um, hi, uh, Mark, my name is Justin. Hey. I'm Chris. And I'm Tasha. <laughs> Justin, yeah. Chris, and Tasha from BCIT. Yeah. Correct. Right on. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to uh, right. <laughs> us. We're just do we're doing, as uh, Chris emailed you before, we are doing an audio documentary on Flat Earth. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for, as I said, Oh, no, no worries at all. I've done a whole bunch of various little documentary things ranging from high school up to, I think you're the first Canadian university or in academic institution, but whatever. So where do you want to start? No, okay. So it's, um, we, so just want to start, um, because there's not a documentary, um, we'll be just having in our documentary, it'll just be your voice. Okay. Um, in the, um, in the whole audio segment, um, let's ask you, what's your name, where you're from, and what do you, and what do you do for a living? Okay. Oh, so you want to say, um, how are you? I, I am well. <laughs> That's there we go. How, how are you guys? Kind of a little bit nervous, but. Nervous about what? Talking to me? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not part of some weird sinister organization. Oh, oh, I got you. Well, no, again, don't worry about it. It's just, it's, we're just talking. It's not a, not a big deal. I have done a ton of interviews in just about every format you can think of from pro to con. Uh, if you guys can come up with an original question that I haven't heard in the last nine months to a year, I'd, I'd be surprised, but you never know. So we'll just kind of go with it and we can go as long as you want. So I've, I've got some time this morning. Oh, and, and I'm, I, I'm recording the audio on this side as well, just so you know. Uh, I generally do it in case, every once in a while, whoever's I'm interviewing with, I, if I ever hear them writing notes, it's like, you know what, I, I, I record everything, just and then I'll send you an audio copy of my side. I, I don't know how you're recording on your side. I'm just using um, MP, MP3 Skype recorder. And, and likewise, too, we are also recording on our end. Perfect. All right. So, my name is Mark Kendall Sargent. I am from Whidbey Island, Washington, which is not too far from you guys. And I am a professional flat earth researcher. That is what I do for a living and have been doing so since so oh, about three years ago, March of 2015. I believe that the world as you know it is basically a building, uh, a structure, a snow globe, a planetarium, a terrarium, a shallow sports stadium. It's enclosed, it's pressurized, and that it, it's so large and the scale of it is so huge that our civilization didn't even figure it out until about the mid-1950s. When the United States and the Soviet Union figured out the outer marker down in Antarctica, way off off the edge of Antarctica in about 1956, 1957. And they just been keeping a lid on it. No play on words there ever since. And just uh, all, just spending a lot of time and money. And really, the, it boils down to sealing off the upper edge and sealing off the outer edge, which is easy. The Antarctic Treaty, which was put in place in 1959, and then militarizing space and faking the space program. Um, at what point did you start to question the idea that the Earth was a sphere? I didn't really give it a second thought. Like like everybody in the community, and I've got to stress this right off the bat, nobody in the Flat Earth community thinks it was. it's a good idea to, to start. Everybody thinks it's just the stupidest, most ridiculous, most insane ludicrous thing you've ever heard in, in your life but uh, because it, and even if you're into conspiracies which i was i i got into conspiracies in the early 90s with jfk the movie by oliver stone and looked at just about everything you know so i had some of my favorites and some not but every conspiracy guy knows in, in addition to non-conspiracy people everybody's heard about the flat earth which is why everybody's got an opinion on it and uh, I, I can tell you that there are a lot of conspiracy people even today. It's like, oh, God, the thing's a piece of crap. It's the, the DVD you got for Christmas you're never going to watch. The the book you're never going to read on the shelf. Uh, you're never, ever going to take a look at this thing. And out of conspiracy boredom, 
in the summer of 2014, I took a look at it and it turned into a Pandora's box where there was a German guy who had made uh, one or two videos and it, they were in German about how the flight paths in the Southern Hemisphere don't make any sense unless the world is, well, flat, but that can't be possible. And I go, oh, it's kind of interesting. And then I ran into a Canadian guy, of all things, you guys can take credit for that, out of Montreal, who said that he worked for NASA as a subcontractor, uh, did artwork for various things. Because, you know, they need marketing guys and painters, too. And he was told that the, the GPS system, the United States GPS system, doesn't work down in Antarctica because it's flat. And so I was like, you know what? These are interesting stories. And I'm a big sci-fi fan. I, I love science, but I'm a huge sci-fi fan. I said, yeah, that's pretty good. I should be able to shoot it down in a weekend. And so I spent a weekend and really dug into it. And that's where everything started to fall apart. The more I dug into it, the more I realized that everything we took for granted, everything we assumed was just that. It was just empty assumptions. There's nothing there. And then it just about February of 2015, it all of a sudden occurred to me I was going about this the wrong way. I, I, I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. So I decided to make a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues, real short, st straight to the point, uh, you know, no, not a lot of heavy thinking involved, you know, just connect the dots, no real math of any, uh, any kind, put it out to the internet hive mind and said, okay, help me here, tell me where I'm wrong and let them fly. And I made one every day for, well, I did seven in the first eight days. And honestly, honestly thought that some academic was going to call me up and, and, you know, some astrophysicist or astronomer or somebody with a master's in physical science and say, okay, here's where you screwed up. You forgot to carry the two, whatever it is, you know, what, you know, this is obvious where you went wrong. You can shut down your YouTube channel now. And the exact opposite happened. That's when everything turned and people started calling me and uh, I mean, everything was unsolicited. The phone just never stopped ringing. My, my email is just a nonstop stream of, of questions and comments and, and things. And so, yeah, here I am three years later, um, you know, prepping for the Canadian conference in Edmonton and the U.S. conference in Denver and uh, the, doc the documentary that, called Behind the Curve, which is going to be released in uh, Toronto next month. I still got to get plane tickets for that thing. So, anyway, hope that rent helps <laughs> and you did mention your youtube channel i've taken a look at that um prior to prior to our documentary here and there's a lot of you put out some a lot of content there and it's racks up a lot of views I, um, it it does but at the same time i i gotta mention that i as many views as my channel has and as many subs as as it has i've given away more than that on two other channels just inadvertently because I made my stuff Creative Commons license. I didn't even monetize my channel for the first 15 months. And there were other people that grabbed my videos and just started putting them in different places. So if you look up uh, things like They Are Hiding God with The Greatest Lie Ever, you know, I think that one's going to hit 3 million hits in a, in a bit. Um, another one called Under the Dome Full Documentary. That's also the clues. That one's going to hit 5 million hits one of these days. Uh, and, and just and all the subs that go with them. It's like, hey, great, fantastic, good for you. Anything to, to further the, the community, so. People who are unaware of um, your work, um, how do they react when you tell them about your views? It, it, it varies. It's a broad spectrum of reactions. It really depends on your educational background and perhaps your field of study and field of study that your parents had or relatives. So if you have a father who is heavy into the aerospace industry, probably not going to react real well. Uh, if you are in, you know, studying, and I don't know what, what you guys are really into, but if you're into, if, if you have a master's degree in a physical science, there's nothing I can do for you because the, the indoctrination is just too thick. You've got, you've had too much schooling. You will not be able to snap out of it. Uh, the the Orwellian conditioning is just is just too heavy, 
but at the same time it's it's kind of split that's why it's so polarizing it's kind of split like with family and friends kind of right down the middle there's some people that that are into it there very few are publicly into it most of the people in our community and even the people i've met and, and read emails i mean there's so many in front of me that are in the closet about it I mean they buy it but they don't know who to talk to about it because they're scared to death of what the reaction might be. Uh, I, I have probably one in two, one in three interviews, people that interview me, they're, they're up front in the, in the production meeting ahead of time that, that they're scared of releasing it as a story because they're afraid of the backlash and and there is a backlash it, again it is amazingly polarizing because it's such a simple concept and we all know this since we're children we are all taught this the globe is in your classroom and you were told literally since you you can comprehend thought which is oh yeah by the way that's where you live we used to think it was flat but now we know it's a globe and you do that to someone even just through straight high school and that's 12 years of conditioning uh, you know they are willing to defend it with denial and anger right off the bat so uh the the short version sorry what your question was you i run into a lot of the you know the five stages of acceptance which is you know denial anger bargaining um depression and then acceptance and I run into that a lot. Uh, there's a lot of people that go through the stages. There's also an, another sect of people that will get stuck in denial and anger, and they will not get past it. And generally, that that comes down to their education, plain and simple. Um, um just one quick comment, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. Just ask that um, when we ask you the question, could you kind of phrase the question at the beginning of your answer? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I can do that. We, we, are, we are doing an audio documentary, and it'll only be your... Got it. Got it. I can. I can. I can do that. So you mentioned the five stages, and you had um, anger in there. So you sound like a chill guy, but have you had any like funny stories or heated arguments? Have I had any funny stories or heated arguments about uh, reactions to flat Earth? Uh, yes. Uh, I can. I can give you two. I'll give you one on the positive and one on the negative. I'll give you the negative one first which was I was doing a radio station interview for, if you've ever heard of uh, the rapper Eminem, he owns a, a series of radio stations and one of them called me up for a, uh, an interview and I was a little surprised. It's like, okay, you know, an urban interview, this should be interesting. And this was not a conspiracy channel, nor was it a call-in show. And yet in the first 15 minutes, they had to, the producer had to stop me and say that, hey, look, uh, just so you know, the phone lines are blowing up. We, you know, would you mind if we actually started taking calls? And it's like, okay, sure, why not? And you can imagine, of course, the, uh, the people on the other end, you know, driving in their cars uh, in, you know, somewhere in, in downtown I don't know, Detroit, really urban, really angry. And they had some choice words for me. And, and, you know, it's it's the general stuff, the stuff you would expect, knee-jerk reactions, which is, oh, you know, you know you're more, I, I'm not going to use all the profanity they used, but it was pretty thick. And we did that for about 20 minutes, and then the, the show finally ended. And at the end, the producer came on with me, and he said, uh, he goes, oh, I'm so glad that you stayed on the phone and you didn't hang up. And that's when I learned, I learned early on and I go, really? He goes, he goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, producers don't care whether you love it or you hate it as long as you're talking about it. The, 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 the death nail for any producer is that you just look at the uh, topic and go, eh, who cares, right? This is one of those topics you absolutely, it's almost nobody is on the fence when it comes to that. So that's the, that's the negative side where the knee jerk reaction for the general public is just very, very, uh, you know, what are you stupid? You know, call every name in the book. The other side of that would be, uh, I went to a meetup, a uh, group down in uh, Pasadena, California, flew me in for a meetup last year. And I was there and there were people that had come in from driven in from, from all over to, for this thing. And it was, it was kind of fun, but there was an Uber driver down there who had picked up one of our people and in the 20 minutes it took her to get from point A to the restaurant where we were at, she became a convert. 
and I know this because the the driver just basically pulled off, you know, the side of the road, you know, at, at the restaurant, shut off the meter, and I ended up talking to her and you know just just chit chat, and we opened the conversation up, and I finally said, "Hey, how long have you been into flat Earth?" She goes, well, "What time is it now?" And it's, I've run into that, but women are way more open minded when it comes to these things than men. I mean, they're not immune to, you know, the biases and conditioning, but they so I've seen people turn very, very quickly. And I was jealous of her because it took me months to flip. But she has a lot more content to deal with than than I did. So. Have your beliefs uh, ever held you back in any aspects of your life? No, no, I've been lucky because when I, because I, the, the career path I took was tech based. So I initially got into the software industry through entertainment and then taught proprietary software uh, in various places across the country and, and sometimes outside the United States. So uh -huh. my belief system was separate from that. So yeah, people knew me, you know, they knew that I believed in different things, but the crowd I hung out with, which were really, you know, a lot of geeks and nerds and dorks, and they're very different, by the way, uh, they were really accepting of that anyway. So n there was no real conflict, but the, no, my belief system has never been squashed and, and my parents were real good about letting me, you know, uh, express myself. Um, while researching the, um, the ins and outs of, of Flat Earth, um, one topic that always came up for us was, um, the role of religion. What, in your opinion, what role does religion play in Flat Earth? Uh, the role of religion in Flat Earth is not just significant, it's entrenched. It's almost essential in that... Uh, the core the core concept of flat earth lends to all aspects of religion and i don't mean just christianity i mean the other the other five the other the big five so buddhism hinduism judaism islam and, and christianity meaning if we are in some sort of enclosed pressurized building then it was built by someone and you know at that point you can only go one two one of two routes which is okay an advanced technology an advanced civilization or something more divine but then you're kind of splitting hairs you know then you're kind of saying okay did god build this or did god subcontract out the work so immediately there was a huge response to uh, to the flat earth in terms of religious groups latching on to the concepts and to where now i would say even conservatively half the members are part of one religion or another and that and it didn't surprise me when i when i ran into it in fact as i was making the clues by the time i got to clue seven which i really hadn't touched on the on the aspect of god i really really took my time to get there uh there were the there were members of different groups of religious religious groups that were contacting me saying look you've tiptoed around this this topic enough it's time you finally you know brought it under under the spotlight and i did and it, and it worked out really well to where I even did a little, not necessarily a parody, but sort of a, a similar story to the Tower of Babel without actually using the Tower of Babel. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the Christian community didn't even have to write me email. Yeah, I got a few emails say, was that the Tower of Babel? Most of them, you know, they knew where I was going with that. So, yeah, the, the religious aspect of this, and unfortunately, if you want the bad side of that, it tends to because because remember religion has been beat over the head by the scientific community for the last 500 years uh you know there's there's a, which is why when i got towards the end of the clues i'm like look i know if you're in a religious house you're you're going to be tempted to want to swing back you're going to want revenge uh you know try to temper those feelings because we're talking about something that's bigger than than a blood feud do you consider yourself a, relig a religious person at all? I do. I do. I was raised, but I fell away from it. So I was raised in a born-again Christian home in a very rural environment up here in the uh, south end of Whidbey Island up in Washington. And because of that, you know, I, I, I didn't even really, I was, I was raised very naively. 
Uh, I didn't believe that even people lied, uh, not on a large scale, of course, you know, people lie about st- stupid things, but on, I didn't believe that authority figures had any reason to lie. And then I saw JFK, the movie and the, and that was by the time that was when I got to university. And when I was there, I re- uh, all of a sudden I was exposed to all these different things and I fell away from the church for decades to where I, you know, and, and then once you get into the tech field, you fall even further and to, to where religion was like, yeah, it's just one of those things. I mean, it was still part of my history, but I didn't, I didn't uh, hold on to it as much as other people. And then when I got into Flat Earth, a lot of it snapped right back because I could see it for what it is. It's like, okay, even, even if it's not a giant Santa Claus guy in a bathrobe, controlling things you know that image uh at the very least it's an advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than us Tom, what do you believe is necessary in order for a flat earth to become generally accepted in the mainstream as fact that's a good question the what what will it take uh a bandwagon more, more than anything, I, what what I've been putting out there and getting other people to, to do is like, look, just just talk about it. Be careful of who you want to talk about it with. You don't want to lose family or friends. But at the same time, the, it is it's become this little well, I shouldn't say little this big secret that that's in uh, that's in the, the the subtext of mainstream media now, but. And, and only in the last six months has it really come to the mainstream. And we've got a whole bunch of stories out there. I mean, after the, the conference, oh, it did so much for us because I was interviewed down that that conference, the 2017 conference, uh, just a few months ago in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was interviewed 14 times in two days by a lot of heavy hitters and, you know, national news media and foreign press. And, and it was great. People, you know, reporters were flying in from France and Australia and Britain and uh, Spain and South America. And it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So we're almost there now. It just takes, it just takes more media to do it. it. Like I try to describe it in the war on science. The first thing you do is you create a massive amount of content and make it available to everybody. The second thing is you get the media to use it in their vocabulary on a regular basis to where the term is used so much that, yeah, even though it's considered a negative term in a lot of people's eyes, it is a, uh, uh, it's still out there as a term it's it's part it's now become part of our vocabulary and it's we're, we're so close but as far as breaking it wide open yeah eventually there's going to have to be a whistleblower from one of the space agencies hopefully nasa somebody somebody older in the nasa field i had somebody on the line a couple weeks ago but he may have died in a hospital i'm not sure What role do you think that NASA, along with any other potential government agencies, play in the flat Earth? NASA is a spe- special agency. NASA, how, what the role that NASA played in this whole thing was to keep an old secret for as long as possible. They were, and for those of the people listening out there, you say they're saying that, oh, well, NASA's fake. You know, you're, you're, are you saying that the entire American space program was fake? I'm going, no, no, it's much worse than that. It's that the only reason NASA was founded in 1958 was to keep this thing under wraps for as long as possible. Meaning eventually, sooner or later, you're going to have to show somebody a picture of the Earth, real or not. And even if you create a fake picture, you can't just hand it to people. That's that's the suck part of faking space. That's the part where all of a sudden the money. So you can't just, yeah, I mean, faking pictures, that's easy. We've been able to do that for forever. But if you hand it to somebody, what's the first question they're going to ask? Well, where did you get the picture? So in order to even do that, you've got to at least create a technology that would be, lead people to believe that you got high enough to take the picture. Even if you couldn't, you've got to convince them of that, and that's what NASA did. They uh, that and they took it so they took it further, which you know they did repeated, amazingly quick trips to the moon. You know, six round trips to the moon, to the moon and back, and then shut down the program in 1972, like a like the ending of a, a show on television. You know, good night everybody, and that's it. You know, 
cut transmission. And that was it. And that they held on to that that image. Remember the the, the first blue marble shot of the the Earth. You can look this up. Was taken in 1972. The second picture was not taken literally until the summer of 2015, when we came out. And we knew this because Obama did a speech on it, and NASA did a press briefing, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted it, and Scott Kelly wrote the briefing and all that fun stuff. So. Yeah, NASA is the the only reason that NASA exists is to keep us believing that we are in we're this tiny little ball flying through infinite space and not just in some giant soundstage. Why do you think that NASA would go through these efforts in order to cover this up? Well, it's it's bigger than NASA. Asking why why NASA would go to these lengths is just part of the bigger issue meaning why would the governments try to hide this at all that's the better question why would the world governments and and it's not like they all knew simultaneously it was the united states and the soviet union that, that figured it out first is because of power simply stated which is you can't be the ultimate authority in the world if you're not the ultimate authority meaning if and and again, people, when they first hear me say that, they're going, well, I don't know if that's a good enough answer. It's like, well, okay, think of it this way. If I'm trying to run you as a government and you all of a sudden realize there's something bigger than me, my credibility gets dis diminished almost immediately. Meaning it's like, oh, yeah, well, eh, your laws are okay and all, but I'd really like to talk to the people that built this place. And up until now the builders of this place have been ethereal. They've just been part of a religion which could not be proved in one way or the other. If it was proven that we are in some sort of structure and that there were, you know, regardless whether you see them or not, people are going to want the answers from them. And, you know, not, not to mention the, the massive backlash that would happen to a modern society. Even if we didn't find out until 1957, think of, think of the overnight uh, ramifications. Uh, you guys coming from a, a technology sector. Uh, every university on every camp, uh, every university, their astrophysics department and their astronomy departments would shut down immediately. Literally, they would not open tomorrow. Uh, the remaining physical sciences, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, take your pick, doesn't really matter. Those physical sciences, they would remain, but they would have to be retooled from the ground up. Their models would have to be rebuilt. Textbooks would be destroyed in mass and they would have to be altered for the new model economics uh you'd have to shut down world markets for months just to figure out the ramifications of what this would mean to you know the stock markets are twitchy as it is i you know down here donald, if donald trump caught pneumonia tomorrow the stock markets would reflect that and that's just one guy you know take think think about all the defense department industries do you still go to war if you're all in one building, if you're all part of the same family, do you still commit hate crimes? Do you, as a defense department, do you still build all these weapons? If you're not going to do that, that that takes a lot of money. And then, of course, the the third side, which is the, the biggest, which is the spiritual side of things, which is all of a sudden you've got, <laughs> you know, the, the, the biggest concept in the history of science, the thing that every other aspect of science is built on, and they're wrong about it. Meaning, you know, the globe that they've been putting, handing out to people for at least 500 years, that's in error. All of a sudden you've got a bunch of people that would, it wouldn't just stop there. People would look at science. The credibility of science would be undermined. The, the foundations would be just shaken. And people would come back and say, yeah, that globe thing, turns out wasn't wasn't the case. What else are you wrong about? And then just take your pick. And, and the, again, the religious side, which is why I emphasized, re, emphasized restraint, which is the religious side it would come at them. You know, every, anything that science ever went after religion about would then be revisited. So you combine those things and the meeting you're talking about, it's like, why do you keep the, the world, the shape of the world a secret? That meeting is about 10 minutes long because the people sitting around that table going, you know, the, somebody says, well, what's the worst that could happen? And then they revisit what I just said. Just then, and it's like, yeah, we're going to keep this thing locked down for as long as we can. And it turns out that's about 60 years.
And now the technology, especially camera technology, has gotten to the point where it's it's all starting to fall apart. That and social media and high speed internet, the three things that really brought this thing down. Elaborating on this, elaborating on the topic here, do you believe in any other so called conspiracy theories? And if so, does a flat Earth play in with those concepts? Do I believe in any other conspiracy theories? Yes, I do, and. I have for some time. I've got my favorites. All conspiracy guys have their favorites. You know, not every conspiracy person believes in every conspiracy. Just about the, the one of the things I love about Flat Earth is just about every other conspiracy you can think of dovetails into it. Meaning what because because it's physically the world. So every other conspiracy other than that pretty much is inside it. So, you know, it's it's like whatever's happening in the gym, gymnasium, well, you're still in the gymnasium, so it still fits, including Hollow Earth. I've only seen one conspiracy not work well, and it's an older conspiracy, which and, and the guys involved have, have just been running for the hills because they, they know it can't coexist with this thing. And that is the secret space program done by uh, Richard Hoagland who said that there's you know, 5 million people already living on the moon and hundreds of thousands of people living on Mars and all this. And the Americans and the Soviets had this secret space program since the beginning. And that can't coexist with flat Earth. It can't because there is no moon to land on. Mars is just a light in the sky. You're just looking at a, a, a light, part of a projection system, part of a giant television screen. So uh -huh. that, that those don't fit. The rest of them fit pretty well. Um, do I care about them as much? No, I don't. I mean, you can bring up whatever. I've got an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of, but they're all second shelf now, second tier, because the flat earth is so huge that it it really reduces the impact of the other conspiracies just, just, just in its physical size. So stuff that I used to care about 10, 15 years ago, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's not my thing. I mean, I've been doing flat earth pretty much nonstop for three years now. And my enthusiasm hasn't hasn't waned in the slightest. What? Sorry, so you're gonna have to talk closer to the mic. Oh, my bad. Um, what would it take for you to be convinced of a spherical Earth? You know, that's an excellent that's an excellent question because I've changed my answer recently, uh, or altered it a bit. The first thing I would do just for the community is I would ask for, and we've been asking for this since day one, because you're never going to find it. And and there's no way you can they can fake it, because if it, it would have happened by now. And that is take any camera, nowadays it would be what, 4K, 8K, whatever, let's say 4K. Strap it on the side of whatever rocket you're shooting up, turn it on, do not turn it off, and let the footage run to where the ground falls off below you, the earth starts curving below you, and this thing goes off into space, and there's the globe. And, you know, show us, show us that unedited, uncut footage running in real time with a, with a simple uh, time date stamp on it. That'd be the, the first thing I would, I would ask for. Uh, that, and, that, and, of course, that's tougher than most because you're asking a space agency to do it. I was recently, because I, I, I do a lot of subject matter experts on my, on my radio show, and I've been recently kind of pushing the, the vacuum issue because I had a vacuum expert call up and he's the second guy that, that kind of specialized in, in vacuum and pressurization. And so the second thing I would ask, or, or again, the, the cheaper version is, you know what? Loan me, put me in, in a NASA space, in a, a NASA space suit and put me in a vacuum chamber on the ground and turn it on. Because up until now, that hasn't happened. All the astronauts only train in an underwater environment. We never see them get into a vacuum chamber. The only footage we've got of the vacuum chamber is some guy in the 60s, and he almost died, like almost immediately, in five seconds after turning it on. The, the power of the vacuum cannot be overstated. It is so immensely powerful. And what I mean by that is an average spacesuit, you know, which is not skin tight, the air inside that thing trying to be pulled out or pushed out, whichever way you want to say it, that spacesuit would become rigid like wood and would become absolutely unusable. You would not be able to move in that. That you would blow up like the the Michelin man, like a like a blimp almost immediately. And yet we do not see that. We we don't see any of that. 
Uh, the same thing with the to extend that real quick would be the ISS. Uh, I, I include a video now in the beginning of my uh, stuff, my radio show, which shows a steel rail car in Germany, which they applied just a, a fraction of the vacuum field to, and it was crushed like a tin can. You do the opposite of that to you know, the ISS, which is just a, a, an aluminum and plastic shell. Tell me how that thing just doesn't detonate almost immediately under the, the vacuum conditions, the air trying to get out of that thing into the vacuum space. So one of those two things would have to ha happen. I'd put myself on the line, you know, going into a vacuum chamber, but I would do it. And I'd have a few objects with me just to make sure they weren't trying to fake it. It's like, okay, you're in a vacuum now. No, no, no. There's easy ways to tell if you're in a chamber. But I would do that for the community. And as far as the 4K footage goes, well, we haven't seen it ever in the history of space programs. So waiting, waiting for that. SpaceX launch and the Red Bull. Oh, uh, which which one do you want me to address first? I, I guess, the Red Bull one. Yeah. Okay. 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 So the Red Bull jump. I, I'm trying to answer this in the form of uh, whatever. So there's two incidents that have happened within a few years. One very very recently, and one uh, I can't remember was Red Bull 2016 maybe. I can't, I can't remember, but the Red Bull jump was very, very interesting because it was one of those corporate things, Red Bull, of course, where he goes up to, I think, 130,000 feet in a balloon with a spacesuit, although at 130,000 feet, you know, the, the air pressure is light, but it's more cold than anything else up there, and he jumps out. Now, what's interesting about that footage is... It, two things. One, when you're looking at the, on the outside camera, the Earth is extremely curved. Extremely. And 130,000 feet is not that high. That's what, 20-something 20, 20 miles? That is tiny compared to hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, compared to like the ISS, which is supposedly at 400 miles. That's, that's just a fraction of, of the ISS altitude. And yet, when you looked at the camera from the inside, when it, you know before he opened the door, and the horizon was just outside that little porthole window, the horizon was perfectly flat. So which one's wrong? And plus, we've got weather balloon footage, which at 120, 125,000 feet, and I could send it to you in two seconds. Uh, it's on this machine, which is, shows the horizon perfectly flat. So who's lying? One of these two can't be, they both can't be right. It can't be perfectly flat on 120,000 feet. And of course, the Red Bull jump, the average person, the reason why they bought that, again, it's just subtle reinforcement, is yeah, they see the curvature in the Red Bull jump and they don't realize that if that curvature was real, the entire world would be the size of, uh, it would be smaller than British Columbia. It would be tiny by comparison it, you know the curvature is just way way too severe and that's ju you just used a fisheye lens otherwise known as a peephole lens when you if you guys have ever looked at a peephole on your door you know the hallway isn't curved but yet the the lens shows you that it's, um the other thing would be the the most recent thing oh i i could spend honestly i could spend an hour just dissecting the tesla roadster the Tesla Roadster, launched by Elon Musk, who did not found, uh, uh, he did not incorporate Tesla. He just bought it, uh, and he's also the. I know he's he's the founder of SpaceX, which is a private space company here in the United States. Supposedly sent up on a Falcon Heavy booster, and the reason why they sent up this thing, what this car, was because they're trying to practice for the moon mission. Now, he has already said that they're going to go to the moon and back, send, send tourists around the moon and back in 2018. That's not going to happen. But Elon Musk, just about every headline he generates is the wildest, most fantastic thing ever. The man, every time he opens his mouth, it's like, why? I, 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 I could get 10 drunk futurists in a room and they would still never make claims that you make. But... He puts, instead of putting a concrete block, supposedly, on the on the top of this Falcon Heavy rocket, he supposedly took one of his Tesla Roadsters from his personal collection and then attaches a mannequin astronaut to it and sends it up into orbit and then supposedly slingshots it around the sun on the way to Mars, if, if, you, believe, if you believe the story. And it is one of the finest uh, examples of misdirection I have ever seen in film. And it was brilliant. Everybody fell for it, including me, for a short time, which was, you know, you have this booster, you know, it's it's the Falcon Heavy rocket with three boosters on the side of it, 
and it gets up to a certain altitude, the boosters fly off and supposedly land on their own using pulse thrust technology, which is straight out of the movies, uh, Battle Los Angeles, if you want to look it up, which is does not exist. But we, we won't we won't talk about that too much. The the booster rockets land two right next to each other, which you would never do. They would land miles apart, but you have to land them next to each other because you have to think for the audience. It's because if you don't, people will be confused about what rocket lands next to what. So you have to land them. So it goes rocket one, rocket two lands. Uh, the one supposedly on the barge crashes. We won't talk about that. And then they cut to car already in space. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant because, and you guys may or may not have caught it when I was, because I was trying to foreshadow it uh, for you, which is what happened to the Falcon Heavy rocket? How did the car get there? You never saw it, meaning the boosters fell off and then you still have this giant Falcon Heavy rocket with a capsule on the end of it. And yet the car, the thing supposedly pops open. That's your money shop that, you know, the, the capsule supposed to split open down the middle. And then that booster is supposed to fall away gently behind it. And you, you would see this for minutes on end. This thing was massive. This supposedly this massive rocket. They weren't going to show it because it's a whole nother layer to the film process, which would have been problematic. So you had the car layer, you had the earth layer, and they just blew off the whole, the whole Falcon thing, even though there were three cameras on that car, you know, one facing the, the driver, one in the headrest and a big giant selfie stick off of the door. None of these cameras caught any of it. It's like, it's just, okay, here's the car in space. And, and everyone's like, oh, wow, a car in space. No one asked the question. How did it get there? Where, when was the release point? It was amazing. Not to mention, again, I don't want to go off and rant. I know you guys are don't want to make this thing run long. The other thing is the indestructible space car, which should have been a soup sandwich the second it was exposed to the vacuum of space. Meaning uh, if there was even an ounce of pressure in those tires, those tires would have blown up uniformly, detonated and destroyed the fiberglass on, on all four sides of that car. Uh, the, the glass windshield, you know, we're talking massive temperatures changes and you guys, you're up in British Columbia, you know what happens. You, you've run into neighbors that pour boiling water or hot water on a cold windshield on a winter morning. What do you think happens? That windshield would have been roasted, uh, not to mention the windshields that were rolled down in the, in the driver's side doors. Those would have shattered almost immediately and pieces would have been flying up everywhere. Uh, the dash, all the plastics involved, the paint, there's no, all the pressurized systems in that car because of the vacuum of space would have would have blown up. The battery still has liquid in it. I know it's not a gas engine for that car. Uh, the transmission fluid, the window washer fluid, all the other fluids, anything in a pressurized system. I know the airbags nowadays are like on a chemical based, so there wouldn't be compressed air. They was, those things would have all got ruptured, all of them. And yet we we saw none of this. It was oh my god, it was it was horrible. Not to mention, let me throw one last thing out for you. When it comes to that, there's one thing that was glaringly uh, omitted for me, which is we're talking at the very least, there's two major companies involved here. There's SpaceX, which is private, and Tesla, which is public, right? Not a single logo anywhere. And you're going, oh, logos shouldn't make a difference. Are you kidding? This is a big promo piece. Why, why, why put the selfie sticks on there if you're not going to put Tesla on the big side or in the hood? Or I don't know, why do you have an astronaut that has no patches or logos on him whatsoever. You could have sold corporate rights to that thing in two seconds. For for you could have sold all sorts of fun things. You could have put hell. Disney would have paid top dollar to replace your stupid generic astronaut with a stormtrooper, and that would have paid. Yeah, they would have paid millions for that. And oh my god, things should have looked like NASCAR, and it was absolutely empty. It was, it was like they were making sure just in case something went wrong to keep their names as far away as they could from it. It was it was very, very obvious. Anyway, sorry. I get excited. <laughs> what do you have to say to people that are on the fence about Flat Earth? What do you have to say to those people? For the people that are on the fence about Flat Earth, there aren't many of you. If you're listening to this right now, you already have an opinion about Flat Earth. And most of the people out there are going to be against it because I was and everybody in the community was. 
when you are shown a globe in your classroom when you're six years old and it sits in your classroom for at least 12 years and then you go to university and say there's another four years in your university and maybe you have your master's and your PhD after that, you are going to have an opinion on this. Absolutely. Uh, the, the comment, anyone that's, that's on the fence, that thinks they're on the fence, well, let, let me take it a different way. If you're listening to this, you've got an opinion, but do not, under any circumstances, take my word for it. Don't believe a, a, a thing I say, because what, what do I know, right? Uh, you know, do your own research and ask questions, and that's how it works with everybody. All I do is, you know, I, I'm the freshman recruiter for the flat Earth community. All I do is get people in the door, and then you know, say, okay, if you can get past me then hey you can do all sorts of other things but you got to do your own research first because everybody's got their own absorption or absorption period meaning that some people can do it in 20 minutes some people it takes them 20 days and some people take longer than that all i do is put the marble in the paint can that is your brain and let it rattle around for a while because you're gonna sit even even one of you three it may happen to you. You're going to go home and it's like, oh, flat earth is so stupid. And then you're going to, you're going to do the absolutely wrong thing. And you're going to try to look it up on the internet and you're going to say, well, and then you'll I'll say, oh, I'll watch one more thing or I'll watch one more thing. And four days later, when you've lost sleep, you'll be wondering, you'll be, you'll be cursing my name. Aren't you as fast as sorry, sorry. Closer, closer to the mic. Sorry, you're fascinating. <laughs> when you mentioned m and my bad but i would like this guy's so cool <laughs> I you know, I well thank you but i i'm more of a, a well more of a geek than a nerd uh the it i have just been lucky to have been in the right place at the right time all i did really seriously i, I am i the best researcher in the world no uh, did my proprietary software training for 20 years really, really help in, in getting the message across? Yes, it did. But all I did was come in to a, a thing that was already already kind of blossoming for maybe six, eight months, and I made the dummies guide for it. That's all I did. I literally wrote the dummies guide for Flat Earth and put it out there and said, okay, let's see if it resonates with the general public. And it did, surprisingly, uh, because everyone thought that. And of course, um, the thing I hear about all the time, it's like, wow, you sound so normal compared to what I would expect a conspiracy person to be. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I don't wear a tin hat and have a facial tick and, and stutter or anything like that, or, or sound, you know, like constantly looking over my shoulder going, wait, did you hear that? You know, stuff like that. But at the same time, I try to be rational about it. Uh, you know, I believe the, the one of the reasons I have so much conviction is because I put myself in the shoes of the conspiracy side, meaning I will look at a conspiracy and say, OK, you know, other people say, oh, this conspiracy is dark and hate this and hate this and don't trust anything the government says. And I will look at it and say, OK, why would a government do this? And would I do the same thing? And most of the time, and I don't care what conspiracy it is, most of the time, I get it. I absolutely get it. You know, it's it's the whole, the greater good. Uh, the, what's the Star Trek reference? Uh, needs of the many out, outweigh the needs of the few. It, it That's what it kind of boils down to most of the time. They're just trying to keep civilization from tearing itself apart. And this is probably the big, biggest aspect of that. And so we'll kind of kind of see where it goes from here. Closer. Oh, sorry. Um, any any last um or anything that we um haven't touched on that you'd like to bring up? Uh, I think really, uh, you know, just that anyone that's listening to this keep an open mind. Uh, if you're heavy into science, and I know that you guys are 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 big science buffs. Think of it this way, most of the science, and again, I come from that tech field. I'm a, I'm a big science guy. I love light bulbs and air conditioning and microwave ovens, even though most people can't explain microwave ovens. Uh, if you're into science, you're into science fiction. It just goes hand in hand. I mean, you're, everyone's got their favorites, you know, Star Trek or Star Wars or, or whatever it is. You got to remember that 
we've written so much great science fiction over the years. Should it surprise anyone that one of these stories was going to be true? Whether it be that, you know, we're in this giant Petri dish and there's aliens looking at us. We, we've covered this concept many, many times, uh, you know, since the 1950s. And only recently have we kind of been revisiting and going, wait, what if it's true? You know, again, so, sort of like the Truman Show which is why I used it in the clues. You know, the Truman Show is a fantastic example of what we can do on a smaller scale. But if you took the Truman Show and made it large enough, could you fool not just Truman, could you fool everyone? And I'm a firm believer that, yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, why, why would it be possible? We just don't like... Let me end with a quote. The, the quote is from Mark Twain, which is, it is easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. And that is so, so true. Nobody likes to think they've been punked. Nobody likes to think they've been tricked. You know, everyone likes to think they're smart enough that they would have figured it out. They would have figured out the magic trick, the, the street magic, uh, the sleight of hand. And in this case, you didn't have a chance because you were born into it. So were your parents and their parents going back 20, 25 generations. So, you know, is there's no one, there's no one even remotely alive or any text out there that, you know, back when we believed that the earth was flat. So now that we're coming full circle, I, I think it's fascinating. And uh, again, I'm just humbled to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Mark. Cool. Any, uh, anything else I can do for you? Really quick. What is the difference between a geek and a nerd? Cause you said it a few times. I need to know. Oh yeah. yeah. You can look this up. Oh, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I, in fact, I had been a, a total nerd. I had to look this up. Okay. So, and you can impress your friends with this. So the, you can be all, actually part of all three. So there's nerds, there's geeks, and there's dorks, all right? A nerd, you guys will, will, will be able to get this. So uh, like the abbreviation for flat earth is FE, but a, but a nerd will know this as... Iron, perfect. Uh, if I say three point one four one five nine, you will have you, you know if you're you may even be able to start continuing. You know you may have that memorized out to thirty decimal points. Um, that's that's what a nerd does. A nerd is is very you know they, they use nerd arguments start out with the word actually, you know because they they will like to you know it's like well actually the you know the formula is this you know the, the light speed shouldn't be measured in in miles per second. It should be measured in meters. per per second with a, a complex formula geeks are usually fanboys and and everyone's got their fanboy in them where they will while driving to comic-con will argue with you for two hours about who was the best doctor who that's that's what a geek is you know star wars versus star trek those guys and then a dork they're usually the, the 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 guy the guys that, that the nerds and the geeks make fun of because a dork will take a candle, a lit candle, put it under a glass piece of gl uh, you know a glass um, cup and put it in the microwave and film it with his camera just to make a YouTube video on plasma, and in the process destroy his microwave because that's not what you're supposed to do. You know, they, you know, they think before they act. It's sort of like a, a reckless, a reckless nerd. So there you go. Um, you, you, you mentioned that you were recording this on your end. Yeah. Um, would, um, would that be possible after we're done here? I'll just get in touch with you on my email and you can maybe send that off. Oh, I'll, no, I'll, I'll shoot it off as soon as I'm done. Uh, I will, I'll make sure it's working and then I will fire it off to the email that you sent to me. It'll be sent because it's, look, what's it tracking at right now? 50, 50 megs or so. Uh, I'll, it, it'll, I'll send it through WeTransfer. Okay. Do you need any, before I let you go, because I got to ask, do you need any graphics? Do you need any little videos? Did you heck, do you think you've got a pretty good beat on that or, or what? Um, it's, as I said, it's an audio documentary. The only image that we'll need is a thumbnail for our, um, for our file. And, um, once this is all said and done, I, um, will maybe, we can maybe rattle a full, full final version off to you. Oh, okay. Sure. Cool. It, and so, oh, what, yeah. were you are guys just turning it in for uh, like look what the common people are doing out outside of university type thing? Uh, it, it's it's uh, the, the assignment's an audio documentary, and it's just uh, we get into groups and we just pick a pick a topic and elaborate on that. Some people are doing local sports teams, others are doing um, first responders, but we decided to 
Oh yeah, you guys, you guys will take the cake. I mean, this will yeah, definitely. I think so too. Um, we probably will be putting it on our personal website just so we can show our production. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll send off a link in the um once it's all said and done, and um it hopefully will um you can rattle us off a file on your end. I'll I'll get in touch on my email because I know you have our classmate Chris's email. Uh yeah, yeah. You know what? Oh oh yeah. You're you know that's absolutely. Right. I forgot it was it was Chris that was sending me the emails. Yeah, send me yours if you're the one that's getting it. Yeah, let's take out the middleman and I'll uh, I'll shoot it right to you. It'll it'll self generate as soon as I'm done. Definitely, I'll get in touch. Other than that, thank you so much for taking that It was lovely chatting. Yeah, thank you guys. And if you need anything else, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. No Perfect. Thank Take care. Okay, thank All you. Right. Have a good Bye-bye.